Uh, one of the things uh, we always ask, people always ask about this time of year is about Christmas. And so I want to take some time to look over some of the same questions that we get asked a lot as far as like origins and uh, dates and how things got started. So let's just go to that. And this is a book I wrote a ways back. It's uh, The Ancient Origins of Modern Holidays. Major reason I wrote it is because there's a lot of disinformation out there. People think something is completely Christian or they think it's completely pagan or they get a lot of things mixed up. And we're going to look at a couple of different things, but basically in here, there's, uh, and you can see this at the side, one of the sections is the Avodazara. And that is a piece of uh, Jewish um, law. It's called, it means, tra basically would be translated foreign worship or something along those lines. And the, the context is it's a chapter about what is it is not pagan what we should or should not be observing, that kind of thing. And what's interesting about that is, um, and I think we have a little piece of that in the Christmas thing we're going to study, but the idea is if there is a holiday, uh, almost all holidays start secular. And that's one thing we have to remember. So if I, and, and this is a great example, if uh, we take Washington's birthday off to celebrate George Washington and the idea of the Constitution or the Fourth of July, say something like that. It's obviously secular and it's it's taken off for a certain reason. And so if we're looking at those things and then say 100, 200 years later, somebody starts a cult saying that George Washington was a God incarnate and they do rites of fornication, animal sacrifice, different things like that, um, then it becomes a pagan holiday. And the concept is what you need to do is to go back and find out all of the data behind it. People today uh, that are called um, pan-Babylonian, thinking that everything is pagan, would go back far enough to see the cult that started worshiping George Washington, that kind of thing, and say, okay, it's pagan, we're done. They don't go any further back to say that that's a weird cult of which we have nothing to do. And the origins of 4th of July, for instance, are very important. And so if there is a statue of George Washington in a museum, because that's probably what he looked like, there's nothing wrong with that. Nobody bows down and worships it. But the things that are worshipped are part of a pagan system need to be destroyed. And that was the, the line that they drew behind it. So another question with that comes up in the Abadazara. And we'll just click on it here, but the foreign worship concept. In here, the text basically says that suppose you, um, there, there's a guy that uh, runs a uh, shrine and they do sacrifices to their God. And because of that, they have extra meat left over, say on Thursdays or whatever. So Fridays, there's, there's half price steaks in the local store. Okay, well, then as Christians, we wouldn't participate because we don't want to fund or uh, a religious cult or be a partaker of that, or especially if you have to go to the shrine to buy the food. And Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians, I believe it's 10, uh, what's called a shambles. And the concept is, should you or should you not eat from a shambles? And a lot of us forget what those things are. The concept, let's say the same guy, uh, runs a grocery store or a restaurant. And in the restaurant, we have decorations of all the gods that he worshipped, Hera, Zeus, Hercules, whatever, along the doors. And so the question is, would we go into a restaurant like that? And the answer is sure, because those things are decoration. No rituals are performed. There's no religious ceremonies performed in a... Um, a restaurant. So if you have a chance to partner with him or buy the restaurant yourself, then by all means, tear down all the pagan stuff. Uh, but, but that's the line of demarcation. So if someone is um, a worshiper of a false god and it's a holiday and you know they sacrifice chickens on that holiday and they come to your store and want to buy chickens, you say no, because I think I know what you're going to do with them come back next week and I'll sell you chickens. 
And so it's that kind of thing. And today, a lot of times we would probably say, well, you get caught up in discrimination lawsuits. I don't bake a cake for a homosexual. I don't marry someone that's not whatever. And, and so they would say, well, that's discrimination. Well, as Christians, we're supposed to discriminate. Otherwise, our sons and daughters grow up and become pagan. And that's what the concept in the scrolls say and everywhere else. But this is an interesting thing. It explains the differences between them. And it's, it's a line that gets confused a lot. So let's hop to our Christmas, and we'll kind of come back to this a little bit. So in this book, we've got from New Year's all the way down, and Christmas is a big one here. So let's first start off, we'll, we'll kind of switch gears and talk about the date of Christ's birth, because that's one question that always comes up when you're talking about Christmas, December 25th. Was he born on December 25th? And if not, why in the world do we celebrate his birth on December 25th? Well, here's a couple of interesting things. We basically have, uh, in this paragraph here, it basically says that in December we have Hanukkah, in March we have Passover, and in September we have Tabernacles. And we've talked a lot about the calendars here. So let me just briefly kind of explain this. The Pharisee calendar begins in the fall, the, um, which is a lunar calendar. Um, the uh, original solar calendar begins in the spring. And so the 15th of the first month on the original calendar is Passover or unleavened bread. And then the 15th of the first month on the Pharisee calendar would be in the fall. It happens to be tabernacles. Okay. So here is a commentary of, from Hippolytus on Daniel. And he says this, for the first advent of our Lord, when Jesus came the first time, when he was born in the flesh, he was born in Bethlehem eight days before the calends of January. So eight days before the first day of January is December 25th, okay? The fourth day of the week, Wednesday, while Augustus was in his 42nd year. Now he's thinking what we call Christmas, say. So how does he get that? Well, we're going to leave him and go to another quote. Here's Clement of, of uh, Alexandria in one of his works. And he says, there are those who have determined not only by the year, of the Lord's birth, but also the day. And they say that it took place on the uh, took place rather on the 28th year of Augustus. And so there's that's 20 years difference from the last quote. But anyway, uh, on the 25th day of the Egyptian month of Passion, which would be March. Further others say that he was born on the 24th or the 25th of that month, it's an Egyptian name, which comes out to our April. So April is around Passover time. Just wanted to point that out to you. And let me just see if there's a couple of others here. Here's Theophilus of Caesarea talking about the birth. We ought to celebrate the day of our Lord on the day soever the 25th of December shall happen. So and he's, he's talking, he's in a a debate on somebody, should we do it on the 25th or the Sunday closest to the 25th or before, you know, that kind of stuff. We always have a Christmas Eve service, for instance, at our church or a Christmas Day service, whatever, um, either on the 25th or the Sunday before, because we always meet on Sunday. So the Sunday before is usually when we do it. Some people would actually have a Christmas Eve or a Christmas Day service, even if it's a Thursday or Friday or whatever, would also have a service. And he's talking about whatever day it happens on the 25th of December, we need to be having a service. That's his opinion. But still note that he's talking about the 25th of December as the birth of the Lord. So here's apostolic constitutions. And it says, brethren, observe the festal days, the holidays. First of all, the birthday, which you are to celebrate on the 25th of the ninth month. Now this kind of goes into uh, a little bit of confusion here, but the 25th of the ninth month. And again, that goes all back to different calendars. But basically, um, as it says in the next one here, that the Lord came and tabernacled among us. That's the actual Greek in the gospels. And tabernacles, again, is 
the 15th of Tishrei for a, for a solid week. So 15th to the 22nd. It's our September, October. So let me paint you this picture. If the Lord was born on the 15th of the first month, then if you use the Essene calendar, it would be tabernacles, and it would be in the fall, basically September. If you got confused and used the Pharisee calendar, it would flip six months, and you'd have him being born on Passover, which is probably by one of the guys mentioned Passover. Now, to complicate it, which actually simplifies it later, uh, the 15th of Tishrei starts Tabernacles, and Tabernacles is known as the Festival of Lights. Now, when we go to Hanukkah, uh, and that's what happened with uh, uh, in the time of the Maccabees, so we see that in 1st and 2nd Maccabees, uh, we see that Jesus observed Hanukkah in, I think it's John chapter 10, so it's a common festival, not God-ordained directly, but a festival nonetheless that they observed. So Jesus is here observing it in John 10, but it is also called a festival of lights. So if you get the two festivals of lights confused, then it's either Hanukkah or it's tabernacles. Now, if we assume that the Lord was born on tabernacles, that would explain why one person using a wrong calendar flips it around and says he was born on Passover. And the other people in, the, uh, in Europe, basically, take the, the Festival of Lights and flip those around. And so we go from September to December 25th. And so that's probably how, I don't know for sure, and I can't guarantee it, but I think that's probably how we wound up with December 25th as the birth date of our Lord in Europe. Because in other places it was different. But that's the only explanation or theory, basically, that would explain why somebody has December 25th and um, September 11th and uh, April, whatever that is, April 6th or whatever, uh, Passover, Passover, Tabernacles, and Hanukkah. So that's my theory on why we have this. We all agree that the Lord was not born on December 25th, uh, but that's the date we celebrate it. And some people are saying, well, we shouldn't celebrate it, especially if it's got any paganism in it, etc. But at Christmas time, because they sell things and make a lot of money, even secular people want to have Christmas because they'll sell presents, make money. And that's the one time of the year you can have not only the Santa Claus and the reindeer and the kids stories, but also gospel stories in the or on the radio in all the shopping centers. Uh, old little town of Bethlehem and all that stuff. So anything, and this is what the church fathers would teach, anything that would allow you to teach about Christ in public more so than you normally can is a good thing. So everybody will remember it during the season. They may get depressed because they don't have enough money for presents. They may remember the birth of the Lord. All that kind of stuff is bat in the back of their mind, and it might be a great time to witness so here's the quote from John uh, 1.14. The word, talking about Jesus, became flesh and tabernacled among us, and we beheld his glory, that of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. So that's an explanation for the timing. And so, okay. So here's another example, another thing that's taught. Some have tried to teach that December 25th was originally a pagan uh, festival that the church adopted, or that the church adopted that particular pagan date, uh, and used that as a way to say we shouldn't celebrate Christmas. Well, again, it's that pan Babylonian deal about going back so far and not being wrong in anything, just understanding this history back to here, but not understanding going back further to the origins. What we actually have is Emperor Aurelian. Uh, and it, you can look this up in, in actually several Roman documents, but the, he moved the celebration of Sol Evictus, the celebration of the sun, from August to December, and that was in 274 AD. So there's, a, there's several Roman quotes we have about 
uh, them doing it to try to compete with uh, the growing Christian group. So in other words, what we have is Christians, because of the different calendars and the flipping the tabernacles and the Hanukkah, and then that becoming a thing on the Roman calendar, which would have been not Gregorian yet, but Julian calendar. Uh, so they're celebrating the birth of our Lord on December 25th, and it's not connected with any paganism at all. And then more and more people are growing and becoming Christian. So Emperor Aurelius then moves the celebration of Sol Evictus from, from August to, uh, to uh, December 25th to try to compete with the Christians. So basically, there is a connection with paganism on the 25th. But it's not that we adopted a pagan date for our stuff. They moved a pagan festival to compete with Christianity. You see the same kind of stuff a lot of times in, in cults like um, that other Roman cult. Let me think. My mind is glitching. Uh, Mithras, the Mithras cult. They have a lot of things that are like a, a wine communion type stuff, and it comes from ancient memories of a lot of things. Uh, and a lot of people confuse that and say, see, we didn't have all our stuff is made up because they have a virgin birth and a God man person and a communion service. And we must have got all that from them. Well, they were before Christianity, but Essenes were way before them. And Essenes had a God man incarnate, uh, a communion service, etc. And so a lot of times, again, you're going back so far, but not all the way. Um, let's see here. Next thing we would uh, mention, one of the things associated with Christmas is St. Nicholas. And St. Nicholas, the actual history is that he was a bishop of uh, uh, Myra sometime before 490. He was a very, very uh, influential bishop. He was known to bring gifts to children, and there are legends about him performing miracles. Of course, there's legends about a lot of bishops performing miracles. That's how they get to be famous bishops. And half that stuff, I'm sure, is not true, but there's a lot of Catholic-y type uh, rituals, saints, bones, things like that connected with some of those things. Anyway, and that's not pagan. That's just something that came later. But anyway, after his death, he was made a saint, and later he became the patron saint of little children. Now, that's in the Catholic circle. Much later, though, his legend was mixed to that of Chris Kringle, and he became the figure behind the modern Santa Claus. So there really was a Saint Nicholas, and, and Santa Claus is called Saint Nick because they're mixing those things together. So Chris Kringle, this is interesting. The name Chris Kringle is usually spelled with K's, also spelled like that. It comes from the Pennsylvania German Christians. In the German language, uh, Christ Kindlin means Christ child. So originally this referred to Jesus Christ, but later became the name of Santa Claus. It's all connected with pieces of church history, Roman Catholicism, the Bible, and other things. And then just stories that developed over the time. So Santa Claus, Santa Claus is a fictional character. He's supposed to be, according to the, the text, a jolly old elf. And this is interesting because we have... Um, uh, there is a pagan religion, a uh, Norse religion, that worships the gods Odin, Thor, Frigga, those things, and they, they live in the world of the gods, which is called Asgard. And between Asgard, which is at the North Pole, and where the people live, there's this long, long place in between that's snowy and icy, and you can't live very long there, etc. And that was supposed to be the land of the elves, and the elves were supposed to be our mediators between the gods and us. That's Norse religion. And there's a lot of, if you're from Scandinavia, there's a lot of Norse religion that still is around. Uh, I'm my, my father, or actually my grandfather and grandmother came to America from uh, Denmark, Copenhagen actually. And um, they settled in the, in the Kansas City, Kansas area, Kansas City, Kansas, Kansas City, Missouri. And uh, But what's interesting about that, those group of people in, in the Middle Ages, uh, first, first millennium A.D., 
everybody was becoming Christian, in name at least. All of the, um, uh, or the vast majority of the governments were Christian. A lot of the peoples were still pagan, but then they slowly and slowly became more and more Christian. Well, Denmark was probably one of the last places to become Christian as far as the, the country, uh, the government, and the people. And they were still doing sacrifices to Odin in, I believe it was 1100 AD. So only about 900 years ago did they actually become Christian Christian. And so they were one of the last groups to do so. There's actually an old temple over on an island. I, be, I believe it's called Zealand. Uh, not New Zealand, but Old Zealand. But there's this island uh, where they used to sacrifice to Odin, and that requires human sacrifice, among other things. And so people tend to forget these things, but those are still around. They've been sitting there for centuries. But it's an interesting thing. So there is some paganism that creeps in. But when we go back and look at history, there really was an Odin who was a great leader of his people, the Scandinavians. It's recorded in many history books, ancient history books. And so he did things. We don't really know that he was bad or good or anything else. But legends developed of, after him, and they started worshiping him as a god. So again, we need to remove the paganism uh, and understand it's more of a shambles type situation and follow the Abadazara, remove any and all paganism, but still remember our ancestors and where they came from and how it goes all the way back to the beginning. So um, so the Santa Claus legend is that he brings Christmas gifts to boys and girls on Christmas. It's called Father Christmas in England and other places. And then there is this Krampus story. Until recently, most of us here in the United States didn't know anything about Krampus. But Krampus is supposed to be a demon. So you can see it's not exactly pagan. It's not a bad god. It's a demon. So it's got a Christian concept with it. But the idea is that St. Nicholas is a saint that would bring gifts to good boys and girls. Krampus is a demon that comes to eat and destroy and drag the bad boys and girls into hell. And in Europe, there's a lot of Krampus celebra celebrations. You can look this up. And there's actually starting to be Krampus movies and Krampus um, celebrations around Christmas in some of the really larger cities like New York and things like that. But anyway, it's an interesting thing. and It shows you it's not pagan per se, but it's a really odd Roman Catholic Eastern Orthodox type situation. So elves at the North Pole, we explain that. And then... Um, Uh, well, we'll go ahead and do this. We've got a couple minutes here. Anyway, um, Tammuz, a lot of people think that the worship of a, like a Christmas tree has got something to do with Tammuz worship. And there's other ideas too. And the thing is, again, we have to go back and figure out who was Tammuz. And when you go back and you look at the Sumerian manuscripts, they all agree, the Sumerian, the Tyrrhenian, the Egyptian, the Hebrew, and then several others all talk about from creation to a worldwide flood, there were 10 rulers of the planet. Uh, and so that would be our Adam to Noah, but they would all have different names. And then afterwards, they would show you how which one of the three sons of the, the one guy went off, and it's our people are from this, you know, great, great, great grandson. And there's a lot of chronicles that actually have lineages going all the way back from a lot of different countries. So, but anyway, when we look at this, Tammuz is actually the seventh, or not the seventh, the sixth ruler in the pre-flood pantheon. So when we put that into the Bible, Tammuz is actually Jared, which is Enoch's father. Now, according to the biblical text or the extra biblical text, it was in the days of Jared that the Genesis 6 angels came to earth, started doing the genetic tampering and we have all the problems from the flood. And so that's part of the legend in a slightly garbled way of Tammuz or Demuzi and the goddess and all that kind of stuff. And so you can kind of see this. And in the book of Ezekiel chapter eight, they're actually doing, uh, the women were weeping for Tammuz and making moon cakes. 
And then there's the image of jealousy. And it's an interesting thing when you look at it very carefully, where, which gate they were doing it at. And it actually tells you an interesting story. But basically, we see this so we can see that uh, the old concepts, Demuzi, uh, Tammuz, Ishtar, things like that, they actually were people uh, that were around be before or after the flood and they became deified. So again, what we want to do is strip away all the paganism. We don't want to do the ritual for mooncakes. We don't want to worship Tammuz in any way, shape, or form or weep for him. Understand that those are garbled histories from pagans. They always garble stuff. And it goes back to the pre-flood world. Understand what happened in the days of Jared and what's happening now and then learn from it and go forward. So we don't want to totally ignore these things. We want to understand why in the world they believe this or did this. Okay, so, and that's all mentioned here. Um, and then there's some other stuff with Odin. So here is uh, just an example that I made. Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. And I thought this is a really good one. Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer is a children's story based on the Santa Claus myth. But it's like a little sub thing. There's Santa Claus in the North Pole and everything. But then this story is all about a reindeer who has a glowing red nose. And then there's, you know, the story, the, all the trappings with it. Well, this was originally written by Robert L. May in 1939. So it has nothing to do with any kind of paganism. Um, however, I know there's a lot of Wiccan groups that worship the horned hunter of the night and other things like that in their in their paganism. And I can see somebody connecting Rudolph in a very weird pagan way, glowing red eyes instead of a red nose, you know, and he's got horns. And so this is another good example of somebody could take something that is either a folk legend, a children's novel, and make it into paganism. And then we get scared and try to, you know, stay away from it. So again, learn what really is pagan, and basically that means don't participate in any pagan rite. If someone wants to pray to a statue, sacrifice something to something, we don't participate to that, and we don't support that kind of a person in any way, shape, or form. Um, let's see here. Christmas tree. This will be kind of interesting when we get to it. So the original Christmas tree idea, and, and people are looking at this now, and I'm thinking... Do you see, no, that's upside down. Well, yeah, and that's because that's the way it originally started. The Christmas tree tradition started in the 7th century Germany. Okay, uh, Boniface, a Benedictine monk, used the triangular shape of a fir tree to explain the Trinity to the pagans. When Germany became a Christian nation, the tradition grew of suspending a fir tree at Christmas time from the rafters of the home. We always used to have rafters and not a ceiling. And so you would hang stuff up. And so this is a decoration for Christmas time. It's a way to show the Trinity. It's got three sides to it. From any angle you would look at it, it looks like a triangle. And so much like St. Patrick back in the 3rd or 4th century used the, uh, the three-leaf clover as a symbol of the Trinity because it's got three leaves, but it's actually one thing. And so these are things that people would take to try to explain the Trinity to people that didn't know about it. So by the 14th century, there were German Christmas plays that included the Tree of Life. And so the two became connected. These would be evergreen trees decorated with fruit, like red apples. Got nothing to do with blood sacrifices or anything. It's just decoration. There's an unsubstantiated legend that Martin Luther was the first to add candle lights to the Christmas tree or the tree of life in the plays. Remember back in those days, you had to be really careful. A, an actual candle in a wooden tree that's no longer alive is not a good idea. Very, very dangerous. So that's the origin of the Christmas tree. Now, a lot of people confuse the Christmas tree with the Asherah trees, and it's based on um, a passage. Let me just find it here. I think I have it in here. Jeremiah 10. Let me just read this. Um, Jeremiah 10, 2 to 4, it says, This is what the Lord says, 
do not learn the way of the nations or those pagans. Don't follow the pagan traditions. Don't be terrified by the signs in the heavens, though the nations are terrified of them. Understand our Lord is in control. And if there is a, um, a celestial sign or something, it doesn't mean we're all going to die and go to hell. We're Christians. We're saved. <laughs> That's something the Lord may or may not be doing, but it's nothing for us to get frightened of. They get terrified and they think the gods are angry with them and they're going to be destroyed. But we don't want to do those kind of things. For these practices of the people are worthless. It's like those old wives' tales and all the the little occult things that people do. Uh, so anyway, indeed, a tree is cut down in the forest. It is the work of the hand craftsman with an axe. They decorate it with silver and gold. They secure it with nails and hammers so it won't totter. Now, people will quote this and say, see, they cut a tree down, deck it with gold and silver. That's the tinsel and the balls and stuff like that. And then put it on a base, put it in your house, and it's a Christmas tree. So that's an Asherah tree. That's what they're saying. And they don't realize this, nor do they read further. They take a cut down a tree in the forest, and then the work of the craftsman's hands with an axe and with knives, they carve it into an idol and then decorate it or plate it with silver and or gold. They make a nice idol out of it. So this, if you, it's verses two to four. If you read on, it explains that. And I think I have that in here. Uh, here's verse five. Their idols are like scarecrows in a cucumber field. They can't speak. They must always be carried because they can't walk. Don't be afraid of them because they can do you no harm, nor can they do you any good. So again, the Christmas tree doesn't have legs or hands or a mouth unless you carve it on there. So they've taken this tree and they've carved it into an idol that has a hands, has hands, uh, feet, and a mouth. And even though it does, it can't speak, it can't walk, and it can't talk, and it can't really do anything good or bad. Basically, we could laugh at the pagans, which we shouldn't laugh at and we should try to convert them. But that whole concept of this God might do something, let's pray to it. It's a piece of wood that you put a piece, you plated it with gold. I know the guy that made it. He, you know, took a brush and he, it's nothing. It can't hurt you and it can't help you. So this is a quote from this. And so it's obviously not Christmas trees. But let me back up here to the top. Here is, um, here's a good picture of an Asherah grove. And it's translated trees, Asherah trees, Asherah poles, Asherah groves. It's translated different ways because a lot of times in the past, we didn't know exactly what they were. So this is, again, going back to the Avadazara to tell us what exactly an Asherah tree is so we can understand it's not a Christmas tree. So in this paragraph, it says, some try to say that the Christmas tree is an Asherah tree, uh, but this is false. In the Mishnah, there is this Avadazara 3.7 that explains Asherah trees. It actually mentions them and tells you what they are, how they're supposed to work, the concept behind them. So there's three kinds of Asherah trees. A, tr a single tree that's planted specifically for the worship of Astarte. And if it's a single tree, it would have lots of lots of branches and leaves. And what they would do is uh, trim it, cut it, and then let the long, long branches fold over. And they would make a type of nook for the idol to go in. So it's either carved and or not carved. Some some of them wanted to not carve anything because everything has to be living. It's Mother Earth and the goddess and that kind of stuff. And so you don't cut it down or or trim it or anything, but you'd shape it into a tree that has a canopy and you'd put the idol in there. Uh, or it's a tree that grew wild and was pruned and kept pruned, you know, and done that way uh, for the Asherah idol. Um, I see, and it, or a tree that grew wild, someone put an Asherah tree under it. Sometimes it can just be a tree and the person doesn't cultivate, but they just put the idol under a tree and call it an Asherah tree. So the first tree, which is planted for that particular thing, it's, it's a group of trees that are planted in a row. And then as they grow up close together, uh, they're shaped into a canopy. 
So that kind of tree is to be destroyed. The second tree was to be allowed to grow if new growth was not removed and it went back to a natural state. So if you've shaped this into a canopy for the idol, you destroy the idol, prune the tree, let it go back to just being trees. And then if it could go back to being normal trees, there's no reason to kill a tree. You know, trees are pretty necessary. So the third tree was, uh, was permitted to grow, but the idol is removed and destroyed. So if it's just a normal tree and there's an idol under it and the tree hasn't been carved or anything, just destroy the idol and leave the tree alone. So those are the th types of Asherah trees and the types of uh, things that, are, that go with it. The, in the in the Avadazara, I don't know if I have this in here, but there's a there's a place in there where it's talking about that that um, they found a, a tree that was odd, and they dug down and they found a uh, what is that thing called a marcola, and there, there's different kinds of idols. This was um, it's the the Roman god. It basically it has three standing pillars, and, and it's to worship the god of war. And what you do is you'd take rocks and you'd throw at it. And if you can always hit the middle pillar between the other two, it shows that you're a good warrior and that's how you worship the god of war. Um, going to any other idol in any other pagan system and throwing rocks at it is sacrilege. It's not how you worship it. So it's an interesting explanation. But they dug down and found the Merkula, so they took it out and destroyed it and left the tree alone because the tree hadn't been tampered with. So there's lots of explanations and stories from the rabbis from these. Um, let's see. So the Christmas tree does not fit into any of these categories. It's not an object of worship, nor does it have an object of worship underneath it. Now, you might have a nativity set underneath the Christmas tree. But again, is it a knickknack or is it, a, is it an idol? Do you actually bow down and pray to the baby Jesus or figurine or whatever that's under the tree? And the answer would be no, nobody does that. Uh, if it is, it could be considered an idol. And then the tree is not the problem, but the idol is a problem. So let's see here. Yeah, the last part of the Avadazara in 3.7 says, what is an Asherah? Every tree that has idolatry below it, whether it's carved into a canopy or and done the traditional Canaanite way or whatever. Um, it's something that has an idol. And I've often said, just think about it, if if uh, the Christmas tree is an Asherah tree, and it, even if it was identical, we've changed the name from Asherah tree to Christ Mass tree. I think Asherah would be upset because we've nullified her tree. We've turned it into something else. So that concept of nullification is really important, how you destroy an idol and put nooks and trees and houses back to normal. If a house was made into a shrine, there's a process how you turn it back to a house. There's no sense of destroying a house. They're expensive. You just get rid of the idol, destroy the idol, you know, patch over the nook that the idol was in, make it into a bedroom or something or a TV room and make it secular and then it's gone. Um, let's see here. So I think that's it. Oh, the concept of evergreens. Um, in the Testament of Levi, uh, it, it mentions how Isaac taught Levi how to perform the sacrifice of priests. And that one of the things that he was told in the Testament, this is Dead Sea Scroll, of the 12 evergreens, offer up the fruit to the Lord as Abraham taught me. So they had fruits and fragrances and, and different pieces from uh, 12 different evergreen trees. So the idea, number one, is an evergreen tree is a symbol of eternal life because it's always green. But it also has certain kinds of resin that are good for anti-inflammatory. We're learning from the herbal medicine stuff in the scrolls. And certain smells and certain other things, and they use them in the sacrifices. So some of this stuff, at least, was used in the temple, like the frankincense and the mirth and, and several of the other things. So just because we have an evergreen tree, doesn't again, doesn't mean it's pagan. It probably goes back to this stuff. Or if it is pagan, a pagan form of it, it's because the pagans remembered this is the proper way of doing sacrifices to God 
and they adapted it to their gods. So mistletoe, for instance, were, were known, um, are long thought to be used by Druids in Europe with a, a mistletoe cer marriage ceremony. Uh, this may be true, but they're oral legends. Roman history records that Druids did write down their history and philosophy, but Caesar ordered the records destroyed. So we really don't have hardly any Druid literature to know exactly what Druids did. Uh, so it's very possible that mistletoe could be their replacement for the temple evergreen stuff when you're doing a, a ceremony. Um, so there are records of some, some druids being worshipers of God and others being totally pagan. So again, in time, the word druid meant high court official, much like magi in the East. Magi is supposed to be astrologer, occultist, but it became a term for high court official. So if you're in a position of power, you were a magi, you were a druid, you were a pen dragon, you know, things like that. We have the same thing in the book of Acts. We have the Ethiopian eunuch. He may have been a eunuch, and a eunuch has a specific meaning. But a lot of times, uh, to protect the harems of the kings, the people that did the things for the kings were made eunuchs, and then sometimes not. But again, the word eunuch became uh, a word for high court official, whether they're actually a eunuch or not. So those terms change from time to time. We'll go ahead and stop there, but I mainly wanted to share with you this. So these legends of uh, the Asherah trees, uh, the misquotes, the origin of the Christmas tree, the origin of the timing of the Lord's birth. So looking at the three calendars, I'm going to assume that it's... Um, uh, September, Tabernacles, when our Lord was born, because that's what the Gospels seem to indicate. And that's very easily confused with Passover going this way, very easily confer confused with Hanukkah going north to, to that. Um, so anyway, so that's a basic rundown of Christmas. Uh, so I don't see a problem with people having Christmas trees. Uh, I, I do see a problem with it all being secular and only about presents. We should be focusing on the Lord and the things that the Lord did. We should always be focusing on the Lord, but using Christmas time to witness if we can out in public. So I'll go ahead and stop there for the time. So God bless you guys, and we'll see you next week.